Hello and welcome to Highland Country Fellowship. We're really glad that you have joined us. If we have not yet met, my name is Bill Rector. I'm delighted to be the teaching pastor here. And uh, whether you are on site with us and more and more of you joining us, I get to see people back every, every week that I haven't seen in a while and you know who you are. And some of you got your old Hawaiian shirts out of the closet just for me and it's kind of cool. It's, it's touching. Um, Although we're not, we're still maintaining social distance. <laughs> Whether you're joining us on site or online, we're really glad that you're here. And we hope that you can experience three things every time that you come here. And the first is this welcoming feeling of people who just like coming to church, which is a little weird, isn't it? I think it's already a testimony to the world. Thank you very much. And I want to tell you something. My sister is here and her husband, Dave. Do you guys want to just wave so people can know who you are? Have you ever, they, they like coming so much they drove from Des Moines, Iowa to come and be with you guys. That's right. That's right. Have you ever seen that game, Two Truths and a Lie? Everything they tell you about me is a lie. <laughs> it's a game. They've been practicing all week. Uh, we also... We also hope that while you're here, you experience this worship. This, we are led by amazing people that make it so easy for us to worship. And, and I just hope that that sticks with you all week long as you worship the Lord. Amen? Thank you. And then, of course, we go verse by verse through God's Word. That's the other thing that we hope that you're going to experience every time you come here. We open the living and active thoughts of the God, and as we muddle those around in our mind. We are changed. We are, we'll walk out of here different people. I hope you were ready for that. So uh, we are going to get back. We had a lot of fun last week. Last week was Easter, and uh, it, was, it was so great to see so many of you. And, but we're going to get back now to our study in Galatians. Uh, the church in Galatia really was a region of Turkey, and Paul and Cyrus went on a missionary journey. It's, it's this red line. They left from a place called Syrian Antioch, and they went around and did this kind of clockwise circle, and they ended up in four cities, another city called Antioch, another place called Iconium, a place called Lystra, and a place called Derby. And they all happened to be in this region, this green region called Galatia. There could have been more churches they planted there, but these are the four we know about. And these are, so there's four churches there. Now, the, the sad thing is that after they got done and got home, or at least were on their way, a group of Jewish traditionalists called Judaizers followed their very steps, and they went in behind them, and they started teaching different things. First of all, they were kind of bad-mouthing Paul. They said, you know, Paul's not one of the original people. He kind of persecuted the original people. Not sure you ought to give him any credibility. But then the worst thing they did was that they told these people who were already saved that they needed to be circumcised and follow the laws of Moses in order to be saved. Now, just imagine that. They're already saved people being told you have to add a bunch of things on top of that. And Paul was furious about it. And this is a dangerous thing, too, because salvation comes by faith, faith alone in Jesus Christ. And there's nothing you can do to work for it. I know we want to. We, we, you know, we got a neighbor lady, when, whenever we give her anything, she works really hard to give us a, a gift of equal or greater value within 24 hours. <laughs> it's, I, you know, my wife is really good about it. I kind of like tricking her. I was like, well, let's just see what happens here, and let's <laughs> see what happens here. She's not watching, I, 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 I hope, man, or I'm going to come home to a, just a toilet papered home of one kind or another. Of course, at least, yeah. So, but anyway, you, you cannot mix works with salvation. It, doesn't, it just doesn't work. There's nothing you can do to earn it. It has to be a gift, and there's no mixing. You can't like sprinkle in a little works because it ruins it. So this is one of those things. Paul was arguing, first he defended himself. He said, you know, I don't know what these guys have told you about me, but um, I got my teaching about the gospel directly from Jesus in the desert for 14 years. You know, and that's like, wow, that's, I, well, I guess we should listen to him. Then another thing he says is, look, you've already been saved. You know what it feels like. Don't let anyone tell you you weren't. It's, it's like, this is a story, I don't know, I was watching a movie where a little girl asked her grandmother, grandmother, it might have been the Waltons, I don't know. 
Yeah, I watch that stuff for sermon ideas, of course. <laughs> One of the little, you know, good night John boy girls asks grandma, how will, I, how will I know when I fall in love? And grandma says, oh, you'll know. Right? And of course, as an engineer, that's just ridiculous circular logic, right? <laughs> but it's true, isn't it? I mean, it, this is an unmistakable experience. When the Holy Spirit enters into your soul and takes up residence, you'll know. By the way, if that has not happened to you, I would really love for us and our church to be a part of leading you to that conclusion. It can be as simple as a prayer where you ask God, you say, God, I know about you. I've always believed in you. I now want to give up the keys to my life and I want you to come drive. I'm inviting you to come in and, and clean up the mess. I want to live with you eternally. That's all it takes. That has to be offered in sincerity, right? And you can't fake sincerity. But that's it. That's the prayer by faith that allows the Holy Spirit to come live inside of you. Once that's happened, you know that's happened. So Paul was talking to the Galatians. They were like, you don't, don't be hoodwinked by these people. By the way, those people that are telling you that you have to do other stuff to be saved, maybe it's because they're not. See, they would know if this experience had happened to them too, right? <laughs> So don't listen to these people telling you you got to do this and you got to do this and that. They're not saved or they'd know better, right? Okay. And then, then Paul gets a little bit deeper into this because they, he says, you know, there's a legitimate question that you could ask here. And there's, what's, well, what then was the purpose of the law, Paul? See, these people told us about the law that God gave to Moses and that, and that, you know, there's, there's got to be some reason for that. And Paul answers his own question. It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. So what he's telling us is there was a temporary arrangement. See, the law of God represents the eternal, unchanging character of God. Thou shalt not kill reflects the character of God that you shouldn't kill anybody. But at the base of Mount Sinai, the Mosaic Covenant was kind of a deal saying, if you can keep all these laws, a great number of blessings will flow to you. So that contractual arrangement, it was over. Jesus fulfilled it. But the laws that reflect the actual character of God, they're still there. That's why we get Jesus telling us this not so cryptic now, hopefully easier to understand message. He's saying, do not think I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. They reflect the character of an unchanging God, right? I'm not, I'm not abolishing that. But this deal that was made at the Mount Sinai, uh, I've not come to abolish the law. I've come to fulfill that deal. You could never do that. I've come to do it for you. So that's been fulfilled. Does that make sense? See, the, the holy character of God is unattainable. Uh, as, I mean, we might, compared to each other, we might look okay, Right? Or at least compared to this person, I might look better than average. Uh, but you know, compared to the holy character of God, the, the sad truth is that none of us fare up very well. Uh, Paul says we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the law required that you behave perfectly holy, as I am holy, God says. And so Paul says this law, it does reflect the character of God, but it's just a beating. It's a beat down. It, all it does is remind you of your sinfulness. But that law, then, it, it did have that purpose. It had that purpose of conviction. But it also had this purpose of something that was, that was like a supervision to us. And so we're going to pick up now in Galatians, back in Galatians after a beautiful week off. Not that you didn't like Galatians. And we're going to pick up in chapter 3, verse 24. And here we go. If you have your Bibles, Galatians 3, verse 24. If not, I think it's up on the screen. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ, that we may be justified by faith. Now that faith has come, we're no longer under the supervision of the law. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you were baptized into Christ, having clothed yourselves in Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed 
and heirs according to the promise. What I'm saying is this. As long as the heir is a child, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. He's subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, when we were children, we were in slavery under the basic principles of the world. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. And this, beloved, is the powerful word of the Lord. And the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. See, these verses go beyond what most of us know about Christianity. These verses go beyond the holiness and justice of God that had to be upheld, so he offered his own sacrifice so that we could, we could meet that. That goes beyond that. This, this goes beyond the mercy and forgiveness that God was, was willing to extend to me and all of the rest of you and is on display so that the whole universe can bring glory to him. All these verses go into an outrageous territory. This, this, this puts grace, God's outrageous, amazing grace on display. He forgave the sin. He upheld justice. But then he adopted the sinner to be his child. Why would anyone do that for me? Why? I remember telling one of my students one time, his name's Austin. Austin, if you're listening, he's grown into quite a young man. Back then, you know you were a little rascal, so let's just admit it. <laughs> we were doing a devotional in the morning, and I said, Austin, suppose you and a bunch of your, oh, let's just call them friends, were out throwing rocks at a car. And then you discover that it wasn't just a car, it was a Lamborghini. And it belonged to Mark Cuban. And you'd done hundreds of thousands of dollars of damage to that car. And the police come and arrest you. And they take you, and Mark Cuban sees you there in the handcuffs, and he says, I don't want to press charges. Let them all go. And you stick around. And he says, I've, I've forgiven you. You don't have to pay me back. I'll take care of it. I will pay the debt. And you look it up at him, and he says, as a matter of fact, I want you to come live in my mansion and be an heir to everything I have. And little Austin, 13 years old, looked up. And it was beautiful because a little tear was forming in his eye. He says, why would anyone do that for me? Now you get the gospel. <laughs> why? I mean, it's, it, wouldn't it have been enough to just be forgiven? Wouldn't it have been enough to just be offered eternal life? No. I, I get to be an heir. I get to be commissioned into the family of God as a son. That's wrong. <laughs> but I'll take it. <laughs> Amen? That's the message today. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And it should change the way you think about yourself, about your relationship with God, and about how you interact with everyone for the rest of your life. Okay. As we'd spoken about, Paul had already argued that the law had this... Uh, restraining purpose for a time. It had a convicting purpose. It reminds us of our sin. But today he brings this supervisory thing. And he begins in these two verses right here. He says, so the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. There's something very interesting about these two verses. They each contain a Greek word that's really rare. As a matter of fact, this Greek word only occurs three times, I think, in the whole Bible twice here, once in verse 24, once in 20, verse 25. And it's kind of an obscure Greek word. It doesn't translate well. So you guys know, if you've been coming for a while, what I do when I have trouble with my Greek, I call on the resident seminarian and Greek language expert, Kyle Carper, our executive pastor. And we have a little thing that uh, we call the geek and the Greek. So uh, I, I hope we're, we're ready. I guess you could tell who's who there. Kyle, you want to come on up here?
Um, I, I tell you, embarrassing you is the highlight of my month. <laughs> now, you, you guys know Kyle does the announcements. Kyle's the executive pastor here, and he and Sammy and I share equal duties. Uh, and uh, he has, he knows, in the same way that I'm kind of a math nerd, Kyle's, I guess, a language nerd. Is that fair? Sort of. Yep. Okay. <laughs> I was for four years. <laughs> So tell me about this word and, and, and what's, what is it about this verse that we need to know? Well, the, the key point you pointed out earlier is that there is a word in these two verses. It's used twice. Paul is the only other one that uses this verse or this word. He uses it in 1 Corinthians. And so it is the three times he spoke. And it's, so it's really unusual. It's not something we see a lot in the Bible. If you want to pull up that slide, this is the word. It's pronounced, yes, of course, pai de gogas. I, P- sorry, pai yeah, exactly, e- yeah. Pai de Gogas. <laughs> Sorry, you such didn't a... the Doors play there in the sixties? Pai de Gogos, or yeah, probably. Okay, I think so. But anyway, it was in yeah. L.A. It was a funny time. <laughs> you're, you're not going to have any time left for the sermon if we do this. But anyway, we're all staying around. Okay, okay, good. We're yeah, the doors Friday. have been locked. Okay, so yeah. Pai de Gogas, yes, I'm sorry for using such a big word this early in the morning, but that is our word. And it was a special word that when Paul used it, his original readers would have perfectly understood what he was talking about. If, whether you were Greek, whether you were Roman, or whether you're Hebrew, they would have known what this word means. But today, as Bill's saying, we don't know what this word means. When we translate it, it, it doesn't translate to anything we have in our culture. So it's very hard for us to get the point of what Paul's saying unless we do a little research and study what this word is. Yeah, and our, our translation that we use is a 1984 version of the NIV. And a lot of you have asked me, that's just the one that I kind of grew up. My mother gave me some audio verses. I, I remember scriptures from that verse. This version, though, is kind of a... I, you, What's the right way to say it? It's kind of a difficult or a strange translation of this word. It's interpretive. They interpret what's going on rather than giving you the literal translation. So we've got actually a couple of these, Kyle. um, And so I don't know if everybody can see this, but on top is the version that we read from the 1984 NIV. And it it says, so the law was put in charge to lead us. It almost sounds like this is a babysitter. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. but then they, they even changed in the most recent NIV, which I think is 2010. They said they've, they've gone back and they've translated the word pae de gogos as guardian. Is, that, right. is yes. that close? That's probably the closest we can get is guardian. What's, what's wrong with guardian, though? Guardian doesn't quite reflect exactly what's going on here. And the, and the culture, the history of this is really important because uh, this word, when a boy turned six or seven in that ancient day, his father would appoint someone to be his, quote, uh, pai de gogos, his guardian, if you will. But that person was more than a guardian. It was, it was actually someone the father appointed to watch this boy anytime he was out of the house. He was with him all the time. When he stepped out of the door, he was with him. He took him to school when he went out to play. No matter what he did, that person was with him. And it was usually an older gentleman who was usually a trusted slave of the family. And he's the one that would be over over this child. So, and if any of you have had young boys, and I have some, they're at a young age, they're kind of suicide machines. They, well, I'm sorry, they, they will get into all kinds of things. And that's, so this person has to be more than just a guardian or right. a babysitter. Yes. This has to be like a disciplinarian. Right. If you literally look at this word, it's made up of two words. The first word is boy, and the second is to lead. Literally, it means boy leader. So he's in charge of leading a boy in this culture. And so his job was really threefold. I mean, there's a lot of things they did, but they really did these three major things. And the first was that he was his protector. When that boy went out of the house, he protected that boy. He made sure he didn't get into trouble. He wasn't any physical harm. And he also protected him morally. He made sure he didn't go, you know, to the wrong side of the chariot tracks or whatever. <laughs> so he, he stayed where he was supposed to stay and didn't go too far from where he should have. So, so that was the first thing. Yeah, you, sorry. You, you, don't, you probably don't let anybody to tell you you're not funny. I know. You're the only one that tells me that. But well. anyway, so... Um, But the second thing is, he was not only a protector, I'll pay for that, um, but he was also his instructor. Now, he wasn't a teacher per se. He didn't teach him in, you know, the classic subjects of school. He was, he was sort of like a tutor, but what he was really teaching him was right and wrong. Now, there is, there is, I don't mean to interrupt, there is another Greek word for teacher, right, that's used 
Yes, yes. Didact uh, yes, didactylos, yes. Didactylos, yes. okay. So. so that's a teacher, and so that person would have been teaching in a school setting, like Bill did, right? But, the, but this guy, what he was going to be doing was he was going to be teaching right and wrong, how to be a good citizen, how to act in public. And so those were some of the things he was doing. And if the boy messed up, then he was his corrector. And that's one of the things these guys were known for more than anything is being harsh disciplinarians. They were very severe in their correction, whether it was yelling at them, you know, corporal punishment, whatever it may have been, he was going to set that kid straight in, uh, in terms of what he was supposed to be doing and not doing when he was out in public. So one of the roles would have been like the boy's vice principal in my high school or <clears throat> like a drill sergeant, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, that, that, that's not entirely what it is, but that's right. probably what the boy would have remembered. Right. So in the English, you might say, well, he sounds kind of like a nanny in a way. He kind of sounds like a chaperone. Sounds like a tutor. He does all these things. And so the best word we can come up with is guardian. It's, it's not a proper word necessarily, but it's the best thing because we don't have that role in American society. So it's very hard for us to figure but out it, exactly But it is. It is. It's a guardian that could whip your behind. Oh, yeah, exactly. The drill sergeant analogy is good because this guy was on your heels. He was in your face. And as long as you're with him, you were under his thumb. Okay, and let me, a couple of other things. Then. If you were living in the first century, whether you're Hebrew, Greek, or Roman, you would have heard this word and you would have known this, Oh, right? exactly, because even if you didn't have one, because this is really more for the rich, but only the rich went to school as well. But if you were poor, you knew what that was. You'd see these people around town. You'd see the young boy with the, uh, the older gentleman who was his pipe. And I think, I guess there's one other thing about this culturally, that, and that is this was a temporary arrangement, right? Yes. Happened when the boy turned six or seven and usually lasted till he was in his early teens. And then the relationship was over and he was in manhood and he was in free. Okay. So this is a difficult word, but I think you've done a pretty good job explaining it. Thank you, it. sir. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen. Opa! <laughs> yes, I'm going to... We're, we're, yes. Uh, maybe we can cut this out. I don't know. But it's a beautiful analogy that Paul's trying to establish here. And, and if you were in this culture, you'd have picked up on it right away. This is a young person who's like a prince, and they're walking around the palace. And yet there's someone making sure that they can't go to all these places, they can't do all these things. So they're kind of, they don't have all the same rights as anyone other than one of the other people that worked in the palace. But they own the whole thing. Until such a time when that comes forward. And this is what Paul, this is an analogy that, that by that very word we would have picked up if we were living in that language. So he's going on and he's saying, this is what you are. Verse 26 says, you're all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And that's the punchline to the analogy. That's what you are. You would have recognized this term in dealing with some other wealthy individual, whether you're Greek, Hebrew, or Roman. He's saying, you're this. And the thing that makes you this is your faith in Jesus Christ. <laughs> and, and, and this is the radical unity that Paul is talking about between Jesus Christ and ourself. See, we don't just want to be a little bit like Jesus. Paul says we have a radical unity. Remember when he said this, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. A radical unity, so much so that I didn't just die, I was specifically crucified with him. You, you get this. See, what's true of Christ becomes true of us because the Spirit of God comes to live inside of us. So the Spirit of Christ that lives in Paul, that lives in me, it's the Holy Spirit. And, and it came into my life at a specific moment that was unmistakable. That's the moment that we call salvation. And the Holy Spirit inside of me provides me a radical unity with Jesus. The Spirit of God lives inside of me and lives inside of all of you. And this is what Paul's saying. For all of you were baptized into Christ. All of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. The word baptized here is specifically describing, and a lot of times in the Bible, it's describing the work and the effect of the Holy Spirit. I'm a huge fan of water baptism. I'm a huge fan of it. Remember, Jesus said, let's make it on earth as it is in heaven, right? On heaven, the Holy Spirit baptizes you and comes to live inside of you. 
on earth, we symbolize that as adults who've made this choice by being immersed totally in water. And if you're interested in that, it's a fantastic thing to do. I promise I won't hold you under there too long unless I have something against you. <laughs> then you're going to want to have a friend in there with you. So this is what, what Paul is saying is when you're baptized, this is what happens. You, your belief by faith in Jesus Christ means the Holy Spirit is like deposited inside of you. Listen to the way Paul describes it in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. This is not just my idea or radical theory. This was written down 2,000 years before I was born and a couple hundred years before Sammy was born. So <laughs> this changes us. This, this, this idea of baptism, it's almost like you're dipping something into a vat of dye and it changes us from the inside out. We look different. And by the way, back then, you know, dye was made by crushed fruits and berries and stuff, and no two vats of dye were exactly alike. So if you dipped a piece of cloth into that vat and dipped another one into that vat, they looked alike. And that's, by the way, they still do that. They still publish dye lots. I learned this, uh, Donna, I learned this from your mom. God rest her soul, Eileen. I bet Eileen you thought I wasn't listening. I was. When you buy skeins of yarn, they publish the dye lot on there. Because if you're knitting a sweater and you run out of this yarn, you want something from the exact same dye lot so it doesn't end up looking like a, a, a crude Hawaiian shirt. <laughs> right? Does that make sense? So when, when we are dipped into the Holy Spirit, that's this idea of, that's the same concept of being baptized. We now look the same as Jesus. And it's almost like there's a clothing analogy. And that would have gone along with the same analogy Paul was building. A Roman, a young Roman man. Here's uh, something I found from a guy long dead now, Frederick Rendell, Rendall. When a Roman male reached son status, his father exchanged his toga praetexta, which means bordered toga, for the toga virilis, the manly toga, <laughs> that identified him as responsible. And so here's a couple of pictures of this. The, the one on the left has the border on it. You can see it. And that meant you were a servant. You were a servant of your father, or sometimes you were a servant of the state, right? That's what that meant. But when you had graduated at a special ceremony, they'd take off the one toga, they put on another. By the way, just a bit of advice, don't search the internet for pictures of togas. Uh, <laughs> it's just helpful advice while we're here. So I hope you understand, this is this metaphor of being clothed. Not only are you dipped so that your clothing looks alike, but now you're going to be clothed this way. And Paul uses this metaphor a lot, right? So I hope you understand the reason Kyle and I are very, the more you know about that culture. See, if you were alive in the first century, these cultural references would have been second nature to you. But we're, we're not, so that's part of what we're trying to pick up on. And it, it changes the way you read verses in the Bible. Listen to this one that you've probably heard before from Ephesians 4, verse 22. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self. That's the bad toga. That's the old toga, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, the manly toga, right? Created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And then he gives a whole bunch of examples after that. He says, put off falsehood, put on telling the truth to people, right? If you lived in that culture, this symbolism would have been there. And it's a radical paradigm shift. See, um, instead of walking around as someone who's just one of the workers in the factory, all of a sudden you're a part owner of the factory, Imagine one weekend you're out on the lake and the owner of the factory has an accident. You save his life. And in gratitude, like an episode of Gilligan's Island, he adopts you as a son, right? But now all of a sudden, the next Monday at the factory, it's different. You're a part owner and it changes the way you think. You, there are rules now that because you're an owner, you don't have to have rules. You don't live under rules. You live under a very different idea. The same would be true. You know, we talked about a drill sergeant. The same would be true when you become an officer. 
you realize that for your 12 or your 13 weeks of officer candidate school, a non-commissioned drill sergeant beats you up emotionally, physically, mentally to make sure they would be with, willing and worthy to salute you as an officer. Can you imagine being commissioned as an officer, which is what happens when the Holy Spirit comes to live, in your, in, live inside of you. Being commissioned as an officer and saying, no, I don't want to live that way. I want to go back and be under the drill sergeant back in basic training again. It would just, it's, not a, it's, a, it's a totally illogical way to live. Paul points this out. I, I, uh, Brian gets mad at me when I put too many verses on the screen, so I intentionally put the whole reading up here once. But actually, I, no, I, I'll, okay, I did that just to highlight four words so you can see it. Paul's trying to tell us this. You know what you used to be? You used to be under authority. You used to be under, 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 right? You hear it four times. Does that make sense? Now he's saying, you're no longer sticking it to the man anymore. You're the man. Right? Now, that doesn't mean we're God, but we are sons of God, and we should walk around as sons and daughters of God. It should change the way we think about others. The next person you meet in this church who's also a Christian is also a son and daughter of God. That should matter how you treat them. And the person you meet out in the street who might not be yet, there's an operative word, yet. They are God's creation made in his image, and they may one day be a son or daughter of God. Do you realize how that will radically change how you treat other people? Paul puts it this way. <laughs> there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. There's nobody you're going to meet today that isn't already a son or daughter of the king or who might be one day. Be careful then how you treat them. Amen? Okay. This is a great statement of Christian liberty, but Paul has organized it in a particular way to answer something specifically. I want to leave this up for a minute. The morning prayer of the Jewish man included three statements. Blessed are you, O God, King of the universe, for not having made me a Gentile. There is no Jew or Greek. Blessed are, you, o, blessed are you, O God, King of the universe, for not having made me a slave. There is no slave or free. And blessed are you, O God, King of the universe, for not having made me a woman. There is no male or female. Of course, there still are males and females. Thank God, by the way. God created and blessed two genders. I can't deny it. It's just the truth, right? But some people struggle with that, and we should help them, but that's just the fact. And there still are. And that was part of the creation even before the fall, and God said, this is good. So there still are these distinctions, but there's no restriction on the access anyone has to God. See, the Jewish people of that day sadly felt like they had access to God and others did not. And Paul's completely undercutting that. He says, no, every human being that you will meet could have the same access to God as being a son or daughter, all because of Jesus Christ. Isn't that beautiful? And this, the, this, this thing that they were all chasing at the time, the inheritance of Abraham, you have it by being a son or daughter of God. I don't know how I get to be an heir to God's estate, but I'll take it, and I hope you will too. Now, Paul goes on, and I'm gonna go quickly through these verses. He, he goes on to, again, repeat some of the things in this analogy, but point out a few other things. What I'm saying is that as long as the heir is a child, he's no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. He's subject to guardians and trustees until the time of his father. And this is, like I say, he's re-explaining this. It is interesting. Just, you know, think about if you've ever seen these movies, there's this little prince walking around. And there's somebody walking around making sure they don't get into trouble. Imagine if that person had been authorized to whip their bottom as well. But, you know, they get every square inch they're walking upon eventually accrues to them. It's a weird thing. Uh, the, the, the thing that is interesting about this is the last part of this verse. Until the time set by who? Who's in charge of the universe? God. Who's not? Me. Or you, for that matter. Sorry if that breaks your heart. 
So this is really interesting. Now Paul is going to take this out of the analogy and kind of bring it down into the real. He's going to say, so also, when we were children, we were in slavery under the basic principles of the world. This basic principles here in the context means things like our basic instincts. Right? We were slaves to our basic instincts. When we were kids, we reached for a cookie, whether mom wanted us to or not. If we never grow out of that childhood when we're born, we are slaves to the basic instincts of being an animal human. But when you're born again, you become a new creation. And you do not have to respond that way. You are actually free to be able to change and act in a way that is different than the instincts of humanity would drive you. And that's the beautiful thing. And all of that happened because Jesus Christ entered time and space. And this is what he's talking about. When the time had fully come, and I, boy, there's an hour-long sermon just in those words. As a matter of fact, I think I'll give it to you right now. <laughs> what this says is this was all planned, intricately planned by God, right? This didn't just happen. He went, oh, plan B. No, this was the planned action of God. When the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive the full rights of sonship, right? Planned that Jesus would satisfy all the necessary conditions that Adam and Eve couldn't, or anyone at the base of Mount Sinai with Moses couldn't, or you or I couldn't. It would be planned that Jesus, notice it says born of a woman, not born of a man and woman, right? That, that, but yet Jesus would be fully human so that he could identify with us. There would be no lack of empathy with us as being fully human. And he would be born under the law. This agreement, this contractual agreement that none of us could fulfill, he was going to fulfill it. Jesus obeyed the law for me because I couldn't. And now another option exists. Paul says in Romans, but now a righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference. In other words, there's no difference in being perfectly righteous according to God's holy standard and accepting by faith the righteousness offered by Jesus. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. See, his whole mission on earth was planned before the foundation thereof. <laughs> and, and, and as God and fully man, he participated and orchestrated in this journey on earth that would lead him to that sacrifice. And you know why he did that? He did that to satisfy the justice, to make it a just thing that God could redeem me out of the slave market and, and make me his son. That's outrageous, but I'll take it. And Paul explains something. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. The, the word Abba here is, a, is, a, is an Aramaic word. It meant Daddy or Papa. And I promise you, Paul does not want us to think back into being infantile about this. This whole passage is telling us to grow up and be grown sons of God. No, the word Abba, Father, is a word of extreme intimacy. This is familiarity, right? And, and notice who is the one that calls God Abba? The spirit within you calls. You and I honestly don't have the right to be that familiar with God. But then because of what Jesus did, the spirit lives in us. And us joined with the spirit, we get to call God daddy. Because he is that familiar to us. Isn't that awesome? You know, the Jews of Jesus' day hated the fact that he called God, he referred to God as his father. And other religions absolutely would have no tolerance for us saying that God is our daddy or our papa or our Abba. But Christianity is not a religion. When it's done right, it is not a religion. It's a relationship. And because of the relationship, you can call out to God 
and say, Father. This is taken in October of 1963. A photographer for Look Magazine was invited into the White House. That, at that time, is President John F. Kennedy. This is just a month or six weeks before, unfortunately, he'd be assassinated. You know, what would, what would it take for you to get within six feet of the President of the United States? By the way, in today's day and age, don't, let's not take that as a challenge, okay? Let's, <laughs> I'm not advocating it. I'm just saying I want you to think about that for a minute. You, you couldn't do that. That's John F. Kennedy Jr. playing under the desk of the most powerful man in the world. Why does he get to do that? It's because of the religion, the things that he practices, his discipline, the works or great deeds that he's done. Yeah, I'm being facetious. Of course not. He gets access to the most powerful man in the world because that's his dad. And this should change the way you pray if you are a son or daughter of God. <laughs> Just... There's, there's the image. Please, let that sink in for a minute. The next time you bow your head to pray, realize the access that you've been granted because of what Jesus did for you. Use it, please. And by the way, I'm a patient in this same hospital. I'm convicted by my own words that I don't always use that familial intimacy enough. Amen? But we can together. We can remind each other. We can remind each other of that picture and what it means to our relationship with God. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. How different would it be if we walked around the earth as though we were a son or daughter of its creator? That's the way it should be. Not, not walking around like you own the place. Right? Not so you can lord it over people, but so that you can bring people to the Lord. Amen? How does it change how you interact with the parking attendant? How does it change when you interact with the waitress at Olive Garden? How does it change when you interact with the, let's just say, tax professional at the IRS? How does it change when you interact with your own son or daughter? How does it change when you pray that you're a son and daughter of the king of the universe? Beloved children of the Most High God, accept your calling like a commission in the army. Isn't it beautiful? Jesus did this all for you, and I don't know why, but I'll take it. So go this week. Let being a son of the king or a daughter of the king change how you think about every time you pray, about every time you do everything, and let's bring more people to that same glory. Let's pray. Lord, I have absolutely no idea why you would want to save a wretch like me. <laughs> but beyond that, why you would want to adopt me into your family and treat me as a treasured son. I am not worthy of that, but I am grateful. I will not boast of anything except what Jesus has done for me. I will serve as I have been commissioned by your Holy Spirit. I would ask that you would allow me to bring others to know you and that you could bring many sons and daughters to glory as you've done for me. So help me, Lord, this week to leave here changed by this thinking and by your love and sacrifice for me. And it is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.